Romans chapter 1, Paul is making the case for putting the Gentiles under sin. And he makes a pretty strong case for it. And as I told you last week, Paul would have made a great prosecutor. It's a whole bigger word for that. Prosecutor, Turk, no, for this. Uh, he would have made a good prosecutor. Because when you get to chapter 2, verse 1, you're going to see just the case he's making and how well he makes his case. So all of chapter 1, everybody that's a Christian looks at that and goes, yeah, that's what the heathen do. They deserve to be punished. And you can see that each one of us probably came from some of that background. But there are those who have been in a church all their lives and have never strayed, been faithful to God. And at the end of chapter 1, and the beginning of chapter 2, he makes a strange statement. And it took me years to figure out why, like I said, I thought there was something that was missing between the end of 1 and beginning of 2. But I just come to realize just what a shrewd guy Paul was when he wrote. So let's look at 118 and then we'll go into chapter 2. Verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We looked at this last week and we found out that the wrath of God is God's hatred for sin. Now the difference between us and God is that God loves the sinner, but God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? Because sin is death. The Bible tells us in Romans that the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So God hates sin because it kills His creation. And that was never part of God's original plan. God is a God of life. God of mercy and a God of love. So, He lays out all of this and um, let's look at verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the base mind to do those things which are not fitting. And if you skip down to verse 30, he says what their characters were like. That they're backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. And he goes on in verse 31 undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. Now, in those last set of verses, Paul makes a clear statement. And what he's saying is that the wicked that are described there, they know that what they're doing is wrong. They know that what they're doing is against the law of God. And some people say, well, how can they know that? The Bible tells us that God will write his laws where? In our hearts. In our hearts and in our minds. Paul made the case at the beginning of chapter 1 that God can be seen through the things that he's made. And that when you look at nature, you can see the beauty, the love, the truth, and the righteousness of God. So that we are without excuse for not following what He dictates. And He goes on to list all of these sins here, and it sounds like reading a local newspaper or listening to the news at night. So that's the heathen. Then He ends it and goes right into chapter 2 and it starts, therefore, this is uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 1, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Who is he talking about here? Chapter 1 was the heathen. Who's being talked of in chapter 2? Who's his focus group? Who's he talking to? He's talking to good church people. Yeah. And what he's telling them is that, listen, 
you know that the heathen deserve to be punished for the wickedness that they do. Because God is a God of love. And God is a righteous judge. Is that right? And he's laying out the case for God's judgment. Does God have a right to judge his creation? Yes. And does God have a right to judge sinners? And brothers and sisters, this is a question you need to answer for yourself because in our day today, the world has a totally different view from what God's word has. And that view has crept into the church. Is God just in judging sin? So he makes the case that, okay, this is the heathen, this is the wicked. Now we get into chapter 2, and now he starts to step on my toes. And he's going to step on your toes. Because if we are able to look at that list of sins in chapter 1 and go, yep, that's wrong, you commit that, you deserve to be punished. We are judging ourselves. Because if we know that's wrong and yet we do the same thing, how will we escape the judgments of God? Paul is shrewd. Paul, like I said, is making a case, a really good case of all humanity. And I thank God that God impressed him to do this because in putting us all together and allowing us all to realize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we're all in the same boat and that God is able to save all of us. He doesn't have a different method of saving the Jew or the Christian or the heathen. All the same. That salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. So let's look at this a little deeper. He says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, do you practice the same things? But we know that the judgment of God is according to what? What's that? Truth. Whose truth? When you judge, you better have something to base that judgment on. Is that correct? So we as humans, we judge all the time. And a lot of times our judgment is not accurate based on false information um, and is colored by our own perceptions. But when God judges, is God just in his judgments? Okay? And again, I ask the same question. Does God have the right to judge? And the answer is yes. So if he does, and if he's righteous in all his judgments, can you trust him to judge fairly and impartially? A lot of people do not like to hear judgment messages. But if you're going to be that generation that's going to live when Jesus comes back, you better understand, this is a judgment message. And this is a judgment day. But the good news, brothers and sisters, is if you're in Christ, you have nothing to worry about. Okay? The judgment message isn't for condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does Romans 8.1 say? For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so, the world has grown tired, the Adventist church has grown tired of hearing, listening, and proclaiming this judgment message. But, this is what we have been called for. This is what God raised this church up for. And the judgment message is not a bad message. It is the heart of the gospel that Christ has paid the penalty for your sin. And that Christ has done everything so that you don't have to be lost. And not only that, but God has promised you His surety, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who will now change you from the inside out so you don't have to stay in your sin. Is that good news? Amen. Are you sure? Okay, so...
share some things with you. There is a wonderful shrewdness in the way that the apostle works up the charge made in the first verse. The first chapter is confined to the heathen. All will agree with the apostle's statement that they are guilty of the most abominable wickedness. They ought to know better is the almost involuntary explanation or exclamation. Paul says they do know better. That's his reply. Or at least they have the chance to know better. And they do know that they are doing the wrong thing. They are without excuse. Whatever men may think about the responsibility of the heathen, all agree that their practices are to be condemned. Then comes the crushing rejoinder. Paul, have you ever seen a bear trap? You know those bear traps that you open up, and if you touch the middle, it's going to come on whatever steps on it. Okay? Paul's setting one of those traps, and he's opening it up in all of chapter 1. And now he starts to talk to those who claim they know God. And he sets it open, and it closes on us in chapter 2. Boom. And it's got you. And it's holding tight. And you can't get out of that trap. That trap is that we are sinners by nature. Think about this. When you have a brand new baby, we're talking like brand new, do you have to teach that little child, that little baby, to be selfish? No. When that little baby wants to eat, is that little baby going to let you know it wants to eat? And if you have a bunch of other things to do, is that baby going to say, well, okay, I'll wait. No. That baby wants something. That baby wants it right then, right now. And as that baby grows up, do you have to teach it to do wrong things? Or do you have to actually teach that child to do right things? So do you understand that it is our nature to do wrong things and that we need to be taught to do right things? We have evangelistic meetings and we bring people in by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands. Do you have to have meetings to bring people to sin? Right? You ever thought about that? So, our very nature that we're born with is, as the Bible tells us, enmity against God. And that without God's help and without God's influence, we are a lost and hopeless creation. And Paul is making this statement right here. In Jesus' day, when he dealt with the scribes and the Pharisees, and we went over this in our Sabbath school class. Did they see their need for Jesus? Did they see their need for that kind of Messiah? Was Jesus what they were looking for as a Messiah? Okay? Now I want you to think about this. When you read the Gospels and Jesus' interactions with the leaders, what was the biggest problem that they had? Claim to be God. One of the big problems he claimed to be God. One of the biggest problems they had was that what Jesus taught and what they taught were in a hundred and eighty degree opposite directions. Is that right? Right? Yes. Jesus said to them, You teach the traditions of men instead of the commandments of God. And Jesus told them that you're willing to set aside the commandments of God for your own tradition. Was that a problem? Who was right in that ideology? Was Christ right? Or were the scribes and the Pharisees right? So, when we look at what Paul is writing here in Romans, it is the same ideology. Are you going to listen to the commandments of men, or are you going to listen to the Word of God? Tradition over Scripture. Righteousness by faith, or righteousness by works. Which one are you going to follow? The title of this message is, 
Anybody have it? Inward versus outward. Inward versus outward religion. What does it say in parentheses? The true followers of Christ. The true followers of Christ. Listen. God still has only one way. God has always had one way. Amen. The devil, on the other hand, has a multitude of ways. Okay? Because anything that is not the true gospel is a false gospel, and that will lead to deception, to heresy, and finally destruction. When Paul gets to chapter 2, <coughs> the people he's writing to are people who have a tendency to judge others, who think they have a righteousness in and of themselves. They can see the sin in others, but they don't want to look at the sin in themselves. Christ came to show them, look, without me, there's no difference between you and them. You're all the same. You ever wonder why Jesus made this comment in the gospel? When he tells a story about Pilate mixing the blood of Jewish people, they were martyred. And they came to him and they asked him, why did this happen? And Jesus gives a really strange statement. He goes, listen, if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to be destroyed as well. These were good followers of God. Okay? Supposedly. But what he's trying to get to their, into their minds is that you have no righteousness in and of yourself. You will never be able to do so many right things that God will look down on you, pat you on the back and say, come on in. Because outside of Christ, even your good deeds are as what? Filthy rags. So, continue to share this. Then comes the crushing rejoinder. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge, you do the same things. We are caught and we cannot escape. If we know enough to condemn the unrighteous deeds of the heathen, we by that very judgment acknowledge ourselves to be without excuse for our own misdeeds. Thou that judgest, does thou do the same thing? It is clear enough that anybody who knows enough to condemn evil in another is without excuse for his own sins. But all will not at once see that the one who judges another does the same thing. Read, therefore, the last verses of the first chapter again and compare that list with the sins that are found in Galatians 5.19. Let's do that. So turn to Galatians chapter 5 and let's look at verses 19 through 21. As you're turning there, I'm going to read you the last part of verses 29 and 30 and 31 from Romans chapter 1. It says that they are wicked, covetous, malicious, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do these things, but they approve of those who practice them. He's talking about the heathen. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Ricky, do you have that? Yes. Can you read that? Verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so, that list, who is he writing that list to? The heathen or the believer? 
that? Say it loud, because I thought I heard both things said. I want you to look at this clearly. Ricky, read the last part of that last verse. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's not even going to inherit the kingdom of God. Right? So who is he talking to here? Alright? So these are all works of the flesh. And this is why Galatians and Romans are so important for us to understand and not just read, but actually take it from here and let's see down to here into the heart. Okay? Because Paul will go into the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. And why it's so important that we as Christians abide, live, walk, and breathe in the spirit of God. And not be controlled by the flesh. Most of the churches today teach a gospel that says you'll never overcome sin. It's okay. Christ took care of all that. Christ did take care of all that, but He took care of all that so you don't have to stay in that condition. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys awake? <clears throat> with me? Alright, so, turn back to Romans, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul now puts everybody in the same boat. Now we're all going to be judged and we all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The difference is, is you're going to either appear there in Christ or you're going to appear there on your own. Now wouldn't you rather have the judge, your lawyer, be the same God? Doesn't that, doesn't that sound like really good? Has anybody here ever been arrested? I'd make you raise your hand, but I might be the only one that would do that. So listen, has anybody ever had to stand before a judge? It's a scary thing, because that guy has a lot of power, or that, that woman, a lot of power, and they can change your life forever. And if he's having a bad day, that can affect how he's going to judge you. But I've stood before a judge, well, more than one. And they are going to make a decision. And I had to have an attorney. And the attorney and the judge were not the same person. And they weren't on the same page. And they didn't want the same things. The attorney was my advocate. And I was hoping that he could talk really good and really nice to the judge. And let the judge like me. But Jesus, he is your judge. And he's your advocate. How can you go wrong with that? So if you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ is your lawyer, how can you lose? Do you ever even have to utter a word? Think about that. Oh, I had to utter some words. It didn't go real well, because as I started telling my story, I started realizing how guilty I was. <laughs> and if I could see it, the judge could definitely see it. So now you just hope that the judge and the lawyer, my lawyer, can actually work out a deal. It doesn't work that way with God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. If Christ is living in your heart through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the judgment is nothing to fear, but it's actually good news for the believer. Why? Because when your name comes up. When you appear before that seat, you just have to stand behind Jesus and let him take care of everything. And will he take care of everything? Yes. yes. And when he's done, you step forward and God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Is that good news? Yes. That's beyond good news. Let me tell you something. If you ever stood in front of a judge realizing, I'm either going to leave here with handcuffs and go to jail, I'm going to leave here free. You start to realize how good news that really is. Because brothers and sisters, an earthly judge, he can condemn you to death. But it's just the first death. God the Father can condemn you to death. And that's what you get outside of Christ. But in Christ, God is a God of love and a God of love. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, so, going back to Romans. 
Verse 4, do you despise the riches of his what? Now look, look at the context and the structure of how Paul is writing this. He goes in to say, therefore you are excusable in verse 1. Verse 2, we know the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Verse 3, do you think that you're going to escape that kind of judgment? Verse 4, I love this because he's making the case for the gospel. Do you despise the riches of his goodness? Is that where his capitalized? Yes. Who's he talking about? Okay. So do you despise God's goodness, God's forbearance, and God's long-suffering, his patience? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? How can God's goodness, his long-suffering, lead us to repentance? I'm not asking rhetorical questions. You have my permission to actually talk. Okay? So think about this. If you don't understand the gospel and you don't understand the character of God, you will not have an answer to this question. Why does he put this in the context of the judgment? That we're all in the same boat. And then he says, do you despise the goodness of God because of his goodness and his patience and his long suffering? What is that telling us? Loves us. He loves us, but not only does he love us, but do you understand that Paul is making a case for the believer and the unbeliever that when God finally judges, there will be nobody that says, you judged wrong to God. That God's judgments will be seen to be righteous and true and just. Why? Because God is patient and long-suffering and doesn't want any to perish but all to come to repentance. So, God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, is continuously wooing the Christian, the believer, and the unbeliever, the entire world, to come to Him. Because if I'm an unbeliever and I get to stand before God and say, You never did anything to draw me to you. I never heard any of this. I never thought about any of this, then I have the right to say, God, your judgment isn't true. It isn't just and it isn't right. So does God have the right? Yes. And when God is judged, and we're going to read this a little later on in the moments, when God is judged, will it be determined that he was just? Yes. Now think about this. Did you know that it's not you who really has to worry about the judgment? It's not you that's actually being judged but who is it God's in the character. end that's being judged? God's God and His character. Why? Because this is why God raised up this church. Because have you ever been anywhere else where you heard the great controversy message? That this controversy between Christ and Satan, Satan made accusations against God and His character? And that in those accusations, he painted God in a specific light that God was a dictator. That God didn't love his creation. God dictated over his creation. And you either do what he says or you're destroyed. Isn't that what heathen religion is all about? Yes. That you have to appease an angry God? Fear of punishment. A fear of punishment. But John tells us that love casts out what? All, all fear. fear. This is the true character and nature of God. And this is why God broke into history once again in the middle 1800s to raise up a movement to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The question is, is what have we done with that message? It has been diluted, polluted, and rejected. And yet we still come week after week after week after week. And for what purpose? Now I'm not talking about you guys. Okay? Because we're all on the same page. But I've been in this church since 1984. And I've seen a lot of changes. And I've seen a lot of things and a lot of teachings that have come down that just still shock me shock me and wondering what happened to the focus that our founders had 
what happened to that zeal that they were willing to sacrifice everything they had, their livelihoods, their futures, to proclaim that Christ is coming and is coming soon and that we need to prepare for that coming. And we sit here today and most, well, let me rephrase that.